kind of tie it in, and then we'll go back and grab from Leviticus, but to tie it in, just, I want you to just hear this word. I'm going to read to you from Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, and I want to tie it in the fact that it, here is uh, the description of what has happened for us. And you who were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. What I want to get to is this year of Jubilee seems really a fantastic time. But what Christ has done for us is better than the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee came up once every 49 years to announce the year of Jubilee had come. So basically one time in every generation. Christ has done this once and for all. Once and for all. And his benefits of this last forever. Okay? So consider the picture of the gospel freedom in the year of Jubilee. We're looking at Leviticus 25, verses 8 through 12. You turn there in your copy of God's Word or follow in the uh, handout that has been given to you. Uh, first of all, we're going to look at the pre-announcement, which is very much tied to the Day of Atonement, verses 8 and 9. The announcement itself of the blowing of the trumpet in verse 10, and then the post-announcement of the eating of the fat of the land in verses 11 and 12. Let me read it from uh, Leviticus 25, beginning in verse 8. You shall, count, you shall count seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that at that time of the seven weeks of years shall give you 49 years. Then you shall sound the loud trumpet on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, you shall sound the trumpet throughout the land. And you shall consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to its inhabitants, it shall be a jubilee for you when each of you shall return to his property and each of you shall return to his clan. That 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of itself nor gather the grapes from the undressed vines, for it is a jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You shall eat of the produce of the field. All right, the first thing I want to look at here is the, the pre-announcement. It all happened on the Day of Atonement, but first let's just consider the, this subject of Sabbath rest, and I'm going to just chase this rabbit, that the law of God is good. Uh, God gave us laws in his word for a specific purpose, and we look at the law. The law is not something to hang on us and hang, hinder us from life. It is good for us. I want you to just notice, I put on Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. Let me just read that. Follow with me. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, and sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Put a little note there, it didn't really mean for those to go on the outline, but you see them there, that uh, the Ten Commandments are not bad. They're not bad for us. They're, they are restrictive in one sense, but they're really in a sense of protective. <clears throat> when it says you shall not commit adultery, it's not to keep you from uh, not enjoying your wife or your husband, but it's to protect what God has established in marriage. He tells us we're not to be a, uh, it says you should not be a false witness, okay? It doesn't mean that, that he has something against what you say, but it, you're not going to be a liar, okay? That there's protection there, and that you can believe people because it's wrong to, to, to lie. Anyway, the point is that it answers what God has placed in our conscience, as he's written his law in our conscience, so we know what is right, and he's just written it down to give us a, another authority of what he's done. So when he comes to the Sabbath, it was not meant to hurt people and to restrict them that, in the fact that it was to keep them from doing something good, it was actually to keep them from killing themselves. <laughs> Do you understand that if God didn't tell us to have a Sabbath day, to a day of rest, we would work seven days. 
we would kill ourselves. And so, as I like that one author said, it was meant to be an oasis in the desert. You're in the desert struggling, 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 and then it's Sabbath rest. An oasis. Recoup and recover. Notice what God said in Exodus chapter 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord, and on it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is in your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Wow. We, uh, you know, we would take this, and then we've seen it, we see it happening in our country. At one time, people took uh, Sundays off, and it was a day when people really took seriously what God said in his word to take a day off. But today, it's like, it's all, like every other day. You look at construction sites. They're going strong today. Okay? They would go every day of the week. God said, no, one day of the week you take off. Not only that, but he gave a seven-year Sabbath. And let me just read to you from Leviticus chapter 25, verses 1 through 7, where they said, The Lord told Moses, spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land I give you, the land sh you shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years you shall sow your field, and for six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruits. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. You shall not reap what grows of itself in your harvest or gather the grapes of your undressed vine. It shall be a year of solemn rest for the land. The Sabbath of the land shall provide food for you, for yourself and for your male and female slaves and for your hired worker and your sojourner who lives with you and for your cattle and for the wild animals that are in the land and all its yield shall be for food. All right, so, so now we have the seven-year Sabbath. Have it. God did it in seven days, he gave us a Sabbath. Now he says in the seventh, seventh year, it is a Sabbath for the land. I had the privilege of serving a rural church in Arkansas where there are a lot of farmers, row crop farmers. And so one of my favorite guys is this guy in a church named Ted Huntingcutt. And he always called me Burr Bob, Brother Bob, but he'd say Burr Bob. And, he, and I'd say, uh, Ted, uh, would this work? I, I, I read this scripture to him. I said, Ted, you, you make your living off the land. Would that work? He says, oh, for sure. I said, how come you don't practice it? Okay, every year, he, I mean, fields that he would plant, right? Before he planted, of course, he'd, he would plow in all these chemicals, all these minerals that he was trying to put back in there, okay? And I said, would that work better? He goes, yeah, but I can't do it. I said, why not? He said, it cost me too much money to stop what I'm doing to do that. He said, because, as he pointed out, he said that if he let it go for a year, it, the design of God and creation is that the, the field would replenish itself with minerals, okay? They couldn't afford to do it. So I said, so you borrow money to plant seed, and you borrow money to put all these chemicals into the ground, and yet it's not, you can't afford to stop for a year. He said, Burr Bob, you're right, you just can't do it. <laughs> now before you start throwing stones at farmers, Okay, okay, just stop and think about it. If we had to just stop what we were doing for a year, okay, where would we get our income? Of course, we're not an agrarian society, so it's hard to think about those things. But God promised, now you stop and think about it, God promised to take care of them, and it was a real act of faith to say, okay, we're not going to plant this year, we're not going to plow, we're not going to do anything. So it was a real rest for the people, it was a rest for the ground, etc., but stop and think about it. The sixth year had to be so plentiful that it took care of the, after the harvest of the sixth year, it took care of the seventh year, and it took care of the eighth year up to the time when they would have a harvest on the eighth year. So stop and think about it. The act of faith, a, a, a parent, a father, would teach his children in the saying, we're going to obey God and take care of the land as God has prescribed. 
and we're going to trust God to take care of us. Well, then there was the year of Jubilee. This is the Sabbath of all Sabbaths for the 49th year, and this including the canceling of the debts, and this is really, this, this ultimate rest, I think, is really described in the book of Hebrews chapter 4 when he says, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Whoever has entered into God's rest has rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter into that rest so that we, no one may fall short of, in disobedience. So a couple of words on Sabbath and the fact that the Sabbath the seventh day Sabbath, okay, was a Sabbath based on God's creation. And of course, in the new Willicott Sabbath and is based on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And interesting that uh, in Mark chapter 2, Jesus said that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. In Acts chapter 20, they, they met together on the first day of the week. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, they met together on the first day of the week. And even it was called the Lord's Day in Revelation chapter 1. So we see the shift from the seventh day to the first day of the week, but nevertheless, it's still a Sabbath as to the Lord. What I want to get to, and I kind of alluded to this, was just think about the planning for the various Sabbaths. You know, you don't do things without planning it. Okay, if you're going to celebrate the Lord's Day, if you're going to celebrate a weekly Sabbath, you take the day off, and it says in Psalm 119, how can a young man keep it pure by guarding it according to your word? So when you live according to the word of God, that's how you guard yourself from breaking the commandment of God. In Jeremiah 17, it says that you are to take care to, for the sake of your lives. Do not bear a burden on the Sabbath. Well, Jeremiah pointed out God was really against his people for violating this very simple thing, taking one day off. And of course, they violated the seven-year principle of taking that off. And of course, they violated the the year of Jubilee, by taking that off. Okay, so they were just throwing out the Sabbath rest just out the door because it was inconvenient. We do it too. Okay, so if you're going to take care of the um, weekly Sabbath, I like to say, you know, I wrote a book on finding delight in the Lord's Day and published that, and, and it's like... Okay, if you want to really find delight in the Lord's day, as it says in Isaiah chapter 58, when you say that the Sabbath is a delight, that's when you'll find delight in the Sabbath. When you decide, I want to really delight in this, instead of making it a day that it's an inconvenience, but you really divide, delight in the Lord, okay, and finding delight in the Lord's day, and we plan for it, and we, be, the, really the beginning of the week, uh, in the beginning of the week, we plan for what will happen on the Lord's day. The seven-year Sabbath, as I mentioned, that, that takes some planning and some doing just to say, okay, we're going to take off on this seventh year. And then, of course, the year of Jubilee involved the planning, too. Okay, look at verse 9 of uh, Leviticus 25. Verse 9 says, Then you shall sound the loud trumpet on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, you shall sound the trumpet throughout your land. A day of atonement. Atonement. Well, we see the atonement, first of all, in the book of Genesis chapter 3, in verse 21, when man is separated from God. Remember, man was hiding from God because he broke the law that God gave him. And because of that, God brought him back into fellowship. And how did he do that? He made coverings for the man and the woman from an animal, right? So you can't skin an animal and have it live. Do you, you realize that? Okay, so that meant God sacrificed an animal for a covering for man. That's what atonement is. There's a covering for us. There's a death that covers our sin to bring us back into fellowship with God. In Exodus 29, it says, Every day you shall offer a bull as a sin offering for atonement. It was a constant reminder that death had to be uh, made to... Uh, to atone for sin. We needed that death. In Leviticus chapter 23, it says, you shall not do any work on that day. It is a day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord. So I brought up Romans chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. For if when we, we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Uh, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received... What? The atonement. The atonement has been made. So, that means that because the atonement has been made, 
The preaching of the gospel is the sounding of the trumpet to say the year of Jubilee has come. We're released from the prison house of sin and bondage and shame. We're released from the bondage of the debt we couldn't pay for our sins. Jesus Christ has made the full atonement payment. The year of Jubilee has come. So, all right, so let's look at the, the announcement itself, the blowing of the trumpet in verse 10, where it says that you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee to you when each of you shall return to his property and each of you shall return to his clan. I'll explain that in a moment, but let's understand this happened once every 50 years, and so it's once in a lifetime for most people. I'm sure that once in a while there was somebody who lived long enough that they were a kid when it happened the first time and they were an old, old person when it happened again. But stop and think about it. I don't know if they talked about it this way, but don't you think they would and say, you've got 10 years to year of Jubilee? Looking forward to that blowing of that trumpet. Wouldn't you, listen to, wouldn't you like that? It's just five more years to the year of Jubilee. It's kind of like a reset. We're going to have a reset here in five more years. So stop and think about it. What that, it, it presents hope. Hope. Okay? So we look at this. Every 50 years, there's a proclamation of liberty. I put on here Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And how shall they call on him of whom they have not, heard, not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how, the, how shall they hear without someone preaching? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Because, uh, the, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what has been heard from us. So the gospel trumpet is the gospel trumpet is the pro proclamation that Jesus Christ has atoned for our sins and we have been set free. All right, let's draw that out again. What is the gospel? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, the gospel that we have to keep in mind is this, that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. In Acts chapter 2, he says, Let all the house of Israel know, therefore, that for certain that God has made him, the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you've crucified. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, the gospel's gone out. The gospel says this Jesus that was crucified is both Lord and Christ. Okay. Because he is Lord and Christ, there's good news that we've been set free. Because he is the atonement for our sins. We're no longer in bondage. So let's just talk about that for a moment. Because when we talk about debt in the Old Testament, it's a little bit different than the debts we have now where we have monthly payments. Okay, you may have monthly, you may have, how's it saying go? You have more monthly than month? That means you're in debt, right? You can't pay your debts. If you have more month than monthly, then it's a good thing. Is that right? Is that something like that? Something how Dave Ramsey has used some kind of illustration like that. So the point is, they were instructed in the book of Leviticus not to charge interest. All right. So, if you were in debt to someone, you know how you paid it off? You paid it off by going to work for them as a bond servant. Okay? So stop and think about it. You got your car loan, right? You can't make the payment. You go to Eric and start working for him for free until it's paid off. But normally a person would go with their family. They would leave their house to go for the, to work for the person to whom they were in debt. 
until it was paid off. Or until the blowing of the trumpet of the year of Jubilee. Say the debt is cleared. That makes a little bit of difference, doesn't it? More than just your monthly payment, your mortgage and everything else, it says you're indebted. But because of the sin of Adam, we were indebted to sin. We're a slave to sin. We're a slave to the bondage of sin, and we're a slave to the ramifications of sin. That's where we're locked into by nature. And because we practice sin, it's just an evidence that we're under that same bondage. In the book of Ephesians chapter 2, it says that we were dead in trespasses and in sins, wherein in times past you walked according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom we all had our, our conversation, our lifestyle in times past. We were led along by Satan. We were in his bondage. Okay. So the year of Jubilee comes with, with the announcement that Jesus Christ has won the victory over sin and Satan and death itself. We're free. Just like the year of Jubilee, if you were in bondage to a, a, a loan shark or bondage to somebody that loaned you money and you couldn't pay it, the year of Jubilee says... You're set free. You go on home now. Go on back to where you belong. And that's exactly what's taken place in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen to these words about Jesus being this glorious redeemer that would come in for us to do this marvelous work. And it says in Isaiah 61, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they shall be called the oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. The year of Jubilee is centered in one person. It's centered in the Lord Jesus Christ. And because he is... The Messiah, because he is the one that would save us from our sins and be the atonement for our sins. He stepped in in this world. It was, this is going to happen now. This is the better than the year of Jubilee. This is better than that because it's not once every 50 years. This is a once for all sacrifice that he would put away sin forever and ever. All right, let's look at the post announcement. I call this the eating of the fat, where there's total rest. Isn't this amazing? Look at look, look, some verses 11 and 12. The fiftieth year shall be jubilee for you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of itself or gather the grapes from the undressed vines. It is a year of jubilee. Or is a year, it is a jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You shall eat the produce of the field. All right, first of all, just stop and think about the rest. I was thinking about the animals Okay, obviously they didn't have those big John Deere tractors in those days. They had an oxen or two or had a, I guess, a mule or something else, you know, to try to pull the plow. I right, stop and think about how that animal looked forward to those Sabbath years. <laughs> okay, stop and think about the year of Jubilee. It's just like, okay, rest, total rest for the people and for the land. New Testament, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. And I'll give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's better than the year of Jubilee. Because many times we're out there working, working, working. People are trying to work their salvation, trying to work to keep their salvation, trying to work to bring the good news back to them. Jesus says, come to me. And I will give you rest. Jubilee was holy. That means it came from God, because God is holy. 
The announcement is God setting us free, and therefore it's holy. It's not to be messed with with adding qualifications. You know, when you stop and think about the, the gospel, you start this uh, little Bible study on the book of Galatians, and people are, we were talking about it this past week, of how many variations there are of the gospel people have changed because they want to add something to it. Paul is very clear. If you add something to the gospel, let you be accursed. That's very strong language. All right, so it's holy. But I want to get to this last point because he said we're going to eat the fat of the land. As he says that you may eat of the produce of the field, or in the King James it says eat the fat of the land. Um, let me just step back again and say, it, wouldn't, it be a, wouldn't it be a great demonstration of faith? to practice the Sabbath of years and the year of Jubilee. To say, we're not planting next year. We're going to wait on God. Now, that doesn't mean on the other years you didn't plant. You just look for God to take care of you. This is much like, remember when God gave manna to his people, said on this on the sixth day, you go out and gather as much as you would want. I mean, people were not restricted how much, but they couldn't, they, they had to eat what was on their plate, right? You know, I, you've probably been told that as a kid. Now, eat everything that's on your plate. If they took it, they had to eat it. Otherwise, it would stink, right? The next day, it would stink. and It was rotten, all right? But on the sixth day, you, you gathered as much as you wanted for the sixth day and the seventh day. God took care of their needs, didn't he? Did that, anybody ever suffer on those days? No, unless they didn't gather on the sixth day, all right? God took care of their needs. God, God took care of the needs of the people when he said, you follow this, I'll take care of your needs, even during the times of the Sabbath of years in the year of Jubilee. So let me just chase this rabbit. It's much like our giving to the Lord, Right? We give out of faith that he'll take care of us. We give out of faith knowing that he has taken care of us, so out of gratitude we give of our tithes and our offerings. Proverbs says, if you trust in the Lord with all your heart, do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes, and fear of the Lord, and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord, and be of, uh, honor the Lord with your wealth, and with the first fruits of your produce, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats bursting with wine. God takes care of you. You demonstrate that you believe him by, take, by giving to the Lord, taking care of the, him right off the top. So in Isaiah 55, he says, Ho, everyone that thirsts, come to the waters. He that has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and labor for that which is satisfies not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat that which is good, and let your soul delight in fatness. I'm not exactly sure how to apply what they ate. Where did they get it? In one sense, they weren't supposed to eat what just went wild, but then it says they eat the produce or the fat of the land. I believe that was they're still eating of what they'd gathered before. Because the, the, the ground produced so much before this, they ever went into the Sabbath rest of years. Don't you believe that? I mean, God just provided so much. And so they were able to glean that and still eat on that like they ate the, like the land was just full of fat. <laughs> just on abundance. Do we eat the fat of the land? Or do we go back to some, something that will not really satisfy? In Isaiah 55, it says, why do you labor for that which will never satisfy? The year of Jubilee has come to announce the fact that Jesus Christ has died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day. We've been set free. Why do you want something else? <laughs> why, do you want to, why do you want to go back to something that just puts a heavy burden on. Why do you want to focus on things? Focus on the trumpet has been blown. The year of Jubilee has come. Indeed, we need to receive the message of the year of Jubilee ourselves, and that is receiving the gospel that is preached. As it says in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 
uh, 1 in verse 9, he says, God has saved us and called us with a holy calling. It's not according to our works, but according to his purpose and his grace given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. He says, now it's made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. We need that gospel message to say, look at what Jesus Christ has done for us. We need to know that gospel message. We need to hear it and preach it to ourselves. Do you ever preach it to yourself? <laughs> I preach a lot to myself when I'm riding my bike and stuff because I'm going over my message. No, I'm talking about preaching to yourself. Reminding yourself of what the gospel says. Reminding yourself that you've been set free. Not by works that you've done or any merit that you have. Because God's sovereign grace has saved you with the blood of Jesus Christ and that alone. There's a words, and I put on your outline, I missed up the, normally I put things in to, when I do an outline, I, I, many times because I know the scriptures in, in King James, and so I call it up in my Bible program, boom, Isaiah 40, verses 1 and 2, right? Yes, that's what I want, and sometimes when I go to place it on my text, I forget to change it to ESV. So you've got a King James version, several King James versions in here, because that's what I, okay. Some of you are thinking, what are you talking about, Bob? I've never heard this verse before. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Could you use some comfort and encouragement? Yeah, we all could, couldn't we? Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, that's to God's people. Cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished. That's the good news I have for you today. We're at war because we are trying to satisfy God's wrath. And we can't do it, and so we're almost fighting against God. And God says, the warfare is over. And he says that her iniquity is pardoned. She has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Double for all her sins. It means God has taken you back to ground zero, forgiven all your sins. And then he's added the righteousness of Christ to your account which means that you stand before God righteous because you really are. Not in what you've accomplished, but in what Christ is for you. So, I'm hoping we're going to learn this song. This is a little pri, okay? I've asked, requested we learn this song, and now that Vicky's back, maybe we'll learn this song. Okay, it's called Blow Ye the Trumpet Blow. I put down here just a, the words of the first verse, and this is how I'll end it today. Blow ye the trumpet blow, the glad, gladly solemn sound that all the nations know to earth's remotest bound. The year of Jubilee has come. The year of Jubilee has come. Return ye ransomed sinners home. We've been bond servants to sin, Satan, and death itself. The blowing of the trumpet says, Jesus Christ has won the victory. Now come on home where you belong.